Good evening. Welcome to We're Not Really Here. Manchester City journey over to Vicarage Road to play their final domestic away game against Watford, of course, after that disappointing result in the FA Cup semi-final against Arsenal. All change at Watford. Of course, who are battling out for relegation. They have a new man in charge in the form of Hayden Mullins replacing Nigel Pearson. So what type of Watford team we face is yet to be found out. Welcome along to We're Not Really Here. We are with you all the way up until kickoff. Thank you so much for joining us. So good to be here. And what a show we have in store for you indeed. Joining us today are two members of our Women's City team. We've got Caroline Weir and Jill Scott. Good evening. How are we? Good, thank you. Good, good, good. How are you, Jill? Yeah, all good. Thanks for having us. Absolute pleasure. It's so great to have you on. And also we've got Natalie joining us as well. Natalie, how are you? Yes, I'm all right, Kel. I'm all right. I'm still a bit gutted after um, the weekend's performance because I thought we were going to win the FA Cup. So I'm a bit gutted. But onwards and upwards, time to, re, you know, to sort it out and to re-show what we can do tonight. That's it. We've got two games left to play in the Premier League, of course. With second place secured, uh, we are looking to that quarter-final leg against Real Madrid. Um, but let's first of all get the team news for the team taking on Watford tonight. Natalie, who Lovely. is our starting eleven? Thank you, Kel. So we've got four changes from the team that started against Arsenal at the weekend. In goal, it's Edison. At right back, it's Kyle Walker. And in the middle, you have Laporte and Garcia. And then the first change, replacing Mendy tonight on the left, we think it's Cancelo. And then moving into the middle, Rodri replaces Gundogan, who drops down to the bench. Kevin De Bruyne and Bernardo Silva, who starts tonight. Um, and also, it's Kevin De Bruyne who is just two assists away now from equaling Henri's record of 20 assists in one season. He did that back in 0203. And then up front, we have Raheem Sterling. And uh, Raheem has scored six goals and assisted one in his last two appearances against the Hornets. Uh, we then have Phil Foden, who starts today, and uh, Mares dropping down to the bench. And then up front, we have Gabriel Jesus. And City, this is a great stat unbeaten in the 33 games in which Gabriel Jesus has scored, winning 32 of them. Um, and that is your starting 11 for tonight. So a few changes from the result against Arsenal. Um, Jill, we'll begin with you. Do you like the look of that team? Yeah, I do. I'm a, I'm a massive Phil Foden fan. So whenever he's starting, I, I do get excited. Um, a player that's come through the academy, was fortunate enough to watch him when he was 13, 14, because uh, obviously we were training at the same facility. So, yeah, I'm excited to see him hopefully get a full 90 minutes. Joe, you're a good person to ask because that is something that a lot of people speak about within the club who have managed to watch Phil grow through the ranks. And they all talk about when you watched him when he was younger, that he was just like a class above the rest. Was he really that good for, throughout the ages? Yeah, he really was. I remember watching him. He must have been about 14 and he was tiny compared to the, the bigger lads. And he just had this natural way of playing football, that, you know, the way he moves and he would just glide past people. And I knew, I, I could have predicted that he'd gone on to play for the, the first team uh, just because he's got a natural talent, but also his dedication. Whenever you see him around the place, he's always got a football in his hand, whether it just be a little ball just kicking it around and it's just great to see that hard work does pay off. Caroline, speaking of Phil Foden, we were just talking weren't we, before the show trying to work out maybe who's going to play where. We think maybe Foden might be out on the left, but of course he can play centrally. Do you, where is there a preferred position for Phil Foden that you think he, he thrives most? I think it was so good is he's such a young player, but he is so adaptable and he can play several positions. I think that's why he's obviously been successful and, and getting in Pep's team um, quite consistently. So I personally prefer him in the centre of the park. I mm -hmm. think he's, he's a lefty and I think that just adds something different um, centrally. But yeah, like you say, he can play out wide and he brings so much to the team. He's so creative and technically he's, he's so good. So I think wherever you put him, he's always going to be a threat to the other team. Yeah, he can do a job. We're very lucky to have Phil Foden. Hey, the Phil Foden fan club right here on <laughs> not really here. Um, we were also speaking about, because of course we've got Cancelo starting again, which we think will be at left back. Mendy is on the bench as well as Zinchenko, who, you know, isn't by trade a left back, but has been playing there. You would be a little bit frustrated, I guess, if you're one of the full backs, naturally on the left side, Jill, who would be seen there. And actually you've got the right back playing on the left. Yeah, I think that's happened to me a few times, not at left back. <laughs> um, but yeah, they put someone in there that's not your position and you think, is it that I'm having kind of a bad run of form? So yeah, I'm sure there'll be players that, that aren't happy, but you've just got to get back to the training pitch and put in the hard work and try and get back into that team. So obviously Pep's made a decision and I'm sure he expects everyone to have a good attitude and just get on with the game. 
And Kevin De Bruyne starts again tonight, which is, of course, we always love to see. He's got this um, potential of this equaling this record or even beating Henri's record. We've been hearing about it for most of the season now, I think, and he only needs two more assists so that he can equal this record. Caroline, do you think that might be on his mind at all? Do you think he might be begging to start at the minute so he can try and break that? Um, I'm not sure. I think he's probably heard about it because we're all talking about it. Um, I think it's such a huge part of his game assist and um, maybe he's not thinking too much about the numbers and just focusing more on what he can bring to the team. But yeah, it might be on his mind and, and hopefully, of course, we want to see him break that record. We were speaking um, just before the show began and also it was off kind of something that I saw in the week saying that now, obviously, with that loss, it's all about building up that momentum ahead of the quarter league, um, the, the quarter final game against Real Madrid. How important is it to get this bounce back and not be going into that Madrid game having not found a bit of rhythm, Jill? Yeah, I think whenever you lose a game, you just want the next one to be the next day. That's a feeling. You just want to get back out there and, and get that win. So hopefully with this game and then the game against Norwich coming up, they can get a bit of momentum. And then, as you say, a couple of wins under the belt and then hopefully get that win against Real Madrid because it's still all to play for and what a fantastic trophy that would be to add to the cabinet. Now, we're going to delve more into the current 11 that's starting against Watford and also look back maybe on that Arsenal game and look forward. But, um, guys, let's talk about you because, of course, you're representative of our women's team and, uh, unfortunately, didn't come back after the restart. And, obviously, it must have been a little bit tough to take with the way kind of things played out in the standings of things, Caroline. Yeah, I think it was. I think, you know, at the start of lockdown, we kept training hard um, in the hope that we would return to play and, and kind of continue the league. We had a lot of momentum at the time we were sitting top of the league. So as players, we were desperate to get back and, and finish the league. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. Obviously, it was it was the safest thing to do. And um, yeah, I think it's probably just spurred us on and given us extra motivation as we go into pre-season now and, and, and make sure, you know, we're, we're sitting top again come that time of the season next year. And Jill, a bit of a new role for you within the team, I'd say, but I feel like it'd be best to, to come from yourself if you want to tell everyone watching. Yeah, I think obviously being offered a, a player coach role um, with the team, I think they're just trying to tell us that I'm getting getting a bit old now <laughs> <laughs> without being too nasty. But yeah, not too much will change. I'm still focusing on playing, still feel like I can give a lot on the pitch. Um, but yeah, it's just great to know that um, there'll be a career there uh, after playing. And yeah, I've even been telling Kaz off just yet. So <laughs> that's why she's still my friend. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was actually going to ask her, how is she as a coach? How is she getting on? <laughs> Yeah, we it's haven't early done days. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think, though, it, it, it means that the club sort of sees you as in, indispensable and they don't want you to go. And um, you, you, we don't like you to be here for a long time. You've been such a huge ambassador for women's football. Of course, you were one of the first big signings that the club made in this sort of new era of, of women's football. And you have been an, a, 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 such a great ambassador. How do you think the, great, the game's grown in those sort of, I want to say, seven years yeah. since you signed? Or is it six, six years since you signed? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, six, seven years which it's gone so fast but obviously getting the opportunity to come to such a fantastic club like this and then living that journey with them that we've been on and um, winning the league winning the treble when when I first came we had this plan and at times I remember getting beat three four games in a row and I was like how are we ever going to achieve what we set out to achieve so it would have been so difficult to leave um, and yeah just so happy really I'm, I'm going into football uh, bouncing around maybe because we've had four months off <laughs> and we don't have to do any more shuttle runs uh, at the local park but yeah it's, it's just great to be part of such a fantastic club so on that because it, it definitely felt like you know what, what happened with the women's team was also what happened with the men's team just a little bit before and, and you mentioned you know you joined and we were losing three four games in a row so what was the process in turning that around and obviously being in the heart of it what, what did it entail and look like you know from from the inside yeah, it was it was really difficult. Um, I think that's the first season there. I think that's why I was celebrating so mad that we actually got our hands on a trophy because that season actually started with uh, three or four defeats in a row. But right. um, I can't give enough credit to Nick Cushion, a uh, fantastic coach, and he really just made us stick to the process, come in every day, have a good attitude, and it will happen. And I think having that belief, he really passed that on to us. So, yeah, I think that's why them trophy lifts look <laughs> very happy because there's a lot of relief as well at the same time well the, the work has really paid off because like you say you've had a domestic treble and we've been laden with trophies really over the last few years um following the team and then caroline you kind of joined two years ago from liverpool buzzing um <laughs> but what, what was the what was the transition like for you and how have the two years at the club been 
yeah, I've really enjoyed my time at City so far, and um, I've won two trophies. And um, yeah, from day one, it was just it was such a professional environment to come into. It was um, every day, like Jill said, it's challenging, and, and you're pushed to to be your best. But um, as professional athletes, we kind of thrive off that, and to play along side players like Jill who obviously has a wealth of experience um, both club and internationally that was one of the, b the biggest things for me coming coming across from Liverpool so yeah I've enjoyed my time so far. So we've had your new manager your new boss on already he was on on, on the Burnley game earlier in the season and um, how's it going so far how is it and I suppose to start with what is it like when you when you have a, a new manager it's when you've been you know especially for you Jill you know Nick was been around so so long for you what is it like when a new manager comes in does it do you have to sort of work out what by. they're like? Or? <laughs> yeah, I think um, I have said to Nick, I'm like, it feels weird you're not being here. I've texted him a couple of times. But I think with Gareth, um, he was always in and around the building, obviously with the under-16s, under-18s academy. What a goal that is. That's <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> she does that in training every day, so <laughs> we're, probably, we're probably not even shocked, but the rest of the people are. Mm. Um, but yeah, Gareth, he, he was such a great guy to be around. So I think him coming in, we already know him, um, but he is quite strict, to be fair. <laughs> he tells me off quite a lot. I'm like, <laughs> I thought he'd be a bit more chilled, but it's good because I think his standard's here because he, he is a winner, um, and I think that's what we need. I think to get that next step and add more trophies, we need to raise our standards, so I think it's been good so far. Of course, one of them trophies that we're missing, much like the men's team is, and of course we're still in the running for it this year, is is the Champions League. Is it is it something that you do think about? Because there is there is an amazing message that comes from Pep anyway with the men's team. You know, it's just the next game and we focus on all the trophies, of course. But is that one that does linger in your mind and think that's that's the one that we want, Caroline? I think so. I think, you know, that's the pinnacle of Champions League. That's what we all want to be involved in. And for me, the last two seasons, they they have been a little bit disappointing. Obviously, we've gone out early on against Atletico Madrid both times, um, which by our standards, we were obviously very disappointed with. It was early on in the season and um, it probably did give us motivation to go on and, and then win things again. But mm -hmm. um, it's not where you want to be. You want to be challenging um, at the end of the season for a trophy like that. So, yeah, that's what we're working towards. And it, it kind of starts now in pre-season and it's definitely something that yeah, we're, lo we're looking forward to. I know you guys have, as you've mentioned it there, you're already back in training and working hard. I wanted to ask you, though, because one of the things that was um, quite pre um, prevalent with City returning was the standard that they came back at, and it kind of was getting a lot of plaudits. How difficult was it to do what they did, of course, because you experienced the lockdown like they did and didn't get to come back to playing football, but to come back at that level, how difficult is that? Yeah, it's tough, I think, um... I mean, we were obviously training alone, weren't we, a lot of the time in lockdown, and that was a challenge in itself. But I think at the same time, maybe the break did some of the players good, you know, the break from actually playing games and they came back fresher, uh, knowing they only had, you know, a small amount of games left to finish off. But no, it's, it's definitely a challenge, and mentally, not only physically, um, to keep on top of it. But yeah, as you've seen, they've come back flying, so uh, they must have been doing something right in lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> um, Joe, I also wanted to ask you, because um, for, for me, and I know I am slightly biased, but I think City have really been quite pioneering and been a massive part of why the women's game has become what it has become. As we look towards the future now, uh, and there's still, you know, work to be done, what would you like to see and, and how, how can it, you know, what, what can the next couple of years look like for the women's game? Well, I think when we first sat down about six, seven years ago, we did speak about what we wanted to achieve on the pitch, but also off the pitch, we wanted to change the perception of women's football and really give it that professionalism. And I think the club's been absolutely fantastic at that. So I think we have to just keep pushing. Sometimes it is good to reflect and see how far we have come um, and appreciate that. But as human beings, you naturally always want more. So I think, yeah, keep raising that bar and then hopefully we can get the teams in the league as well to join us because we need a more competitive league um, and it is getting better every year but we need it to be more competitive each year so that internationally it has a knock-on effect as well. And you're both such huge ambassadors for, for the women's game obviously every, everything that you've already achieved Jill and you, you're you continuing to do and yourself Caroline you're um, a global ambassador for an initiative called Girls United could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah that's right so um over lockdown, I had a bit of time to reflect and, and think about what was kind of important off the pitch and charities and things like that is, is something that I'm quite passionate about, especially gender equality and just pushing girls especially to, to go and achieve whatever it is they want to achieve. And, and football is such a great kind of resource to, to do that. So, yeah, Girls United is basically 
a charity where girls go along and play football. They, they learn, obviously, football skills and things like that, but also social skills that are transferable and, and whatever it is they want to go and achieve and, and, and just kind of show that um, anything's possible and if you want to go and do something, there, there should be opportunities out there to do that. Absolutely. And, and, and if we look at, you know, to, to, to the girls now that, that will be involved in that, is it a different landscape they're entering when it comes to the game compared to what you will have been entering way back when? Because I guess it would have been such a, a different and maybe more difficult to do when you started. Well, I think so. I think it was very different and probably even between me and Jill quite different as well when we were growing up. For me, I didn't have that female role model um, in sport uh, to look up to, whereas I think now female footballers, tennis players, whatever it is, we are a lot more visible. Um, you know, England doing well at World Cups, things like that, do inspire the next generation of young girls to go and achieve uh, whatever it is. And I think that's so important to, to see, for young girls to see that whatever it is, they can do it if, you know, they've yeah, got people like us to, they, to look up to. Yeah, absolutely. Well, absolutely. It's that whole thing of, and, and we've been talking about, I think, a lot, uh, generally in a lot of fields over the last four months, is it's just that visual representation. Like, how can a young person, you know, look up to be something if they've got no one to aspire to be like and I guess having role models is, is the most important thing with that are you able to fit in all, all that alongside the training I'm just conscious the coach is there I'm, yeah. I'm just checking yeah, in yeah, yeah. do you know what I mean that you can keep both going yeah, though yeah training for us she's got to be in bed in that one <laughs> um, and, and a quick comment then on, on next season of course because the pre-season is coming around so so what are the targets I'm guessing are, we're going for all the trophies again yeah, everything. I think every game we're in it to win it. Um, as you say, take one game at a time, but we know that we'll we want to win everything. Um, I think it would be foolish of us not to set them goals. And you look at the squad that we've got, and I'm excited for next season. Um, I really am. So, yeah, let's look forward to it. I'm absolutely buzzing. Now, we were going to do this a bit later, but while we're here, and we, we did see it before, um, there's a certain goal that went down at the derby, <laughs> Caroline, that if, I mean, I'm sure every City fan has seen it, but let's just enjoy it again. Can, you, can, you, can you talk mine. us through it? <laughs> 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 And of course, this is a goal that has recently won you as well. Um, goal of the season that was uh, voted for by the, by the fans as well. That camera angle is wow. incredible. What was going through your mind at this point? Uh, do you know, I get asked about this goal all the time, which is surprising now because it was quite a while ago. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, at the time, I think it was a tough game, wasn't it, Jill? And, and we were kind of struggling to, to keep the ball. And I just remember picking the ball up at, um, on the edge of the box for the first time and, and thinking, let's have a go. Um, and just actually thinking, don't hit it over the bar. Just like hit, um, hit it on target because some in training do go all over the place. So, uh, but yeah, no, it was it was definitely a, a highlight of mine. Um, and it was a great day for the team as well, kind of at the Etihad. Um, yeah. It was, it was such a good result, yeah. wasn't it, Natalie? It was such a brilliant goal. And for me, I was at the game and it was so, it was not only was it a brilliant goal, but to me, it was a really important goal because this was at the Etihad. It was the first derby because United only recently started their women's team which <clears throat> excuse me like Jill said is so important that all these big teams get women's teams and we welcomed United getting a, a women's team um, and so to have a game with such a big crowd at the Etihad where there were so many people watching it might have been their first experience of a women's game to see such an insane goal it just it was I just felt it was so important as more than just as the goal did you get that feeling or were you just like I just do this all the time I just <laughs> yeah this is just what I do <laughs> Uh, no, I, I do think it was um, it was such a big day for women's football as a whole. It was, I think, it was the first day of the season, and it was a record crowd, and it was at the Etihad. So, you know, it was a proud day to be part of the club, but also as women's football on a bigger scale. And of course, it was nice um, for it to be a goal like that, I suppose. And um, yeah, just to kind of showcase what the women's game is all about. The touch, though, as well. I know we talk about the finish, but that, that interception on the outstretch to bring it down and then surge forward. Genuinely, I've, I've watched that goal far too many times. Um, well, let's, let's look to tonight's game then. Of course, we've had the team sheet from Natalie and one man who has had kind of some stops and some starts is Jao Cancelo. He is starting tonight, and here is what he had to say ahead of the game against Watford. Joao, still the Champions League to play for. What's the thinking of the players going into these last two Premier League games? É um jogo como como sabemos é para ganhar. Nós jogamos sempre para ganhar. Tivemos a última derrota frente ao Arsenal, em que não fizemos um bom jogo e é um motivo agora nestes dois últimos jogos do campeonato fazer um bom jogo para para estarmos motivados para para a Champions. 
Yeah, we always play the games to to win, and obviously we didn't have a good result on Saturday, so we need to get back to the to the same way of winning again. And obviously we have an important game again in the Champions League ahead of us, so we need to keep performing and keeping the the condition and the shape to be able to face it in the in the best condition possible. It was very disappointing for you all at Wembley at the weekend. What needs to be better about the team's performance going into these final matches? Um... Penso que o que temos que fazer melhor é melhorar a nossa atitude, um, porque nós somos uma equipa que jogamos, jogamos muito bom futebol, mas há coisas por vezes que, que não é só o bom futebol que, que nos ajuda a, a ganhar e penso que, que o resto falta-nos uh, mais atitude, uh, penso que um, também nos falta algum, algum querer uh, e é isso que vamos tentar melhorar nestes dois últimos jogos para, para como disse, chegar na melhor condição ao jogo com o Real Madrid. I think sometimes it's a matter of attitude. I think we've been playing an amazing football towards the whole season, but sometimes with football it's not enough. You need the attitude. So sometimes we, ha we need to have that, the desire of winning and the hunger. And I think that's something we need to prove and we need to keep having uh, for the last games of the season. Sure, Watford's manager has very recently departed in a critical week for this club. What impact do you feel that might have on their approach tonight? É, o seu treinador foi demitido ah, no último sim, sim. jogo e agora tem novo. Que impacto acha que pode ter? Uh, bem, não, não sei responder muito a essa pergunta. Uh, sabemos que vamos encontrar uma equipa difícil, como todas, como todas as que defrontámos na Premier League. Uh, a Premier League é uma liga muito competitiva e certamente que o Watford vai ser uma equipa muito competitiva. Uh, e nós esperamos estar, estar da melhor maneira possível para, para lhes defrontarmos e ganharmos. I don't know what the impact of the new manager at Watford is going to be. What I'm sure is that they're a very difficult team to face, like every Premier League team, and we'll have to be in our best uh, performance and our best level to try to get the three points today. Sure, thank you very okay, much. Thank you. Thank you. Obrigado. That was João Cancelo giving us his thoughts ahead of tonight's game against Watford. A player that, you know, really did light up the Serie A last season, um, of course, when we signed him from Juventus, and has had a bit of a, a stop-start career within the team. As a player, you know, when you kind of come over, of course, to a team, you're conscious there's going to be competition for places, but when you've not quite got the run of games that you were maybe hoping for, how do you go about keeping that positive mental attitude, you know, and not kind of going, oh, well, I'm just going to just sit back and, and, and let it do its thing? Jill, how, it what is. is the best thing? It's difficult because I think I've played um, under a lot of managers and they're always like, make sure you wear your face in the right way if you're not playing so you're not selected <laughs> and you're trying to just do this awkward smile and inside you're, like, crying. Um, so I think any player would be lying if they said that they don't want to be playing when the, the team sheet's uh, read out, but then I think... I think as teammates, obviously me and Kaz both play in midfield and you don't want to be disrespectful. Obviously you want to play, but you, you want the team to do well overall. So I think, yeah, I think you just have to get, get on with it. There's no other way. You just have to get on with it. If I ever see you on the bench now, I'm going to be yeah. clocking you to see what your face is like to see if you suck <laughs> like that. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, talking about managers, though, as we've mentioned, Watford have um, sort of strangely sacked their manager this week. Or what feels strangely, he, he of course, took over when they were bottom and he's got them, Nigel Pearson's got them out of the, the bottom three and they need a point now to um, stay up. So they are playing for a point to stay and we are playing for pride. Which one do you think is probably stronger? Oh, I think... Obviously, it's it's very difficult. I think it's it's weird timing, really, when when you look at it. But usually, when a manager does change, I don't want to say this, but the team does well, doesn't it? In that yeah. in that next game, there's always some kind of reaction. Um, so hopefully, not tonight. <laughs> no, and we, we kind of also saw it similarly in in the Bournemouth game, of course, who literally were were playing for survival, so through everything that was, and we, and we saw it in the game here. You know, I, they they really pushed that second half as well, and we were lucky to come away. I think with the two one win. Um, how do you go? about preparing for a game like this thing Caroline because of course Pep said as well you can't really watch any of the old footage because it's going to be a new manager you're not really sure who, what team you're going to come up against so what would the prep look like then do you think? Do you know I'm not sure it would be too different I think um, I know what we do is just focus on ourselves a lot of the time so we have a process we have our own tactics things like that our own footage that we watch and we have a, a clear game plan to stick to so of course we, we look at oppositions but I think you can't read too much into that because teams change their systems and, and all that kind of thing obviously with a new manager it's it's a little bit of the unknown so nobody's too sure kind of what, what they'll look like tonight but um, I think again you've just got to focus on yourself and, and if you know the game plan that's the main thing. 
And will that have been made clear as well, do you think, to the players? They'll be aware of going, look, they are, they are fighting for survival, so they're going to be you know, putting their hearts and souls on the line. That'll be something that the City players will definitely be thinking of, Jill. Yeah, I think it will have been said to them because you usually do want to get a bit of a reaction in that way from the team. Like, you've got to be ready for this. They're, they're going to come at you. But I think, as Kaz touched on, I think especially when you're a possession-based side, sometimes it's only you that can beat yourself. And I'm sure that's what Pep will be saying. If you keep the ball, then we can beat any team on our day. So I'm sure that's what he'll have been saying. Well, speaking of that man, Pep Guardiola, we can now hear what he had to say ahead of the game at Vicarage Roads tonight. Pep, with a big prize still to fight for next month, with what mindset are you going into these last two Premier League matches now? Try to play good, first play the competition. Of course, uh, we don't play for for anything except to to do our job what we have to do and recover our good good feelings. You were clearly disappointed by aspects of the performance at Wembley at the weekend. What improvements, what reaction are you looking for from your players here tonight? No, we ourselves try to do our game and uh, in the way we have to play, try to do it again and again. Four changes tonight from the semi-final team. Is your thinking with the team selection mainly about making sure everyone has minutes before the Champions League comes along? Well, right now, no, because uh, we start to think about, uh, you know, to prove some plays. Of course, these two games, but after we have two weeks uh, to prepare the game against Madrid, so it doesn't matter who's going to play now. The training will be fundamental to to play against in Champions League game. What challenge are you expecting from Watford here tonight, given recent events, given the departure of Nigel Pearson? Well, they play for uh, for important thing. You know, they change the manager, so I don't know the way they're going to play. But uh, I expect an aggressive team for the fact what are they what they are playing for. So this is normal, and try to, to challenge this this rhythm that they will they will put on the pitch. You always prepare very well for matches. When something like this happens, what impact does that have on your preparations? Uh, less job to do. So you cannot watch uh, any game with this manager, so you cannot do it. But at the end, it remains the quality of the players. It doesn't matter setup, so the quality of Dini, of of Dakure, of Hughes, of Saar, or uh, Pereira, so uh, are there. So with one manager or the other one. Pep, appreciate your time. Thank you. That was Pep Guardiola there giving us his thoughts ahead of the game. And there is the man that is taking charge of Watford tonight, Hayden Mullins. Actually, his second stint as caretaker manager. He uh, did have two games in charge in the interim before they announced Nigel Pearson. And since he has departed, he is now back in the fold. Raheem Sterling there as well on the team sheet. Kevin De Bruyne all gearing up for the six o'clock kickoff against Watford tonight. If you've just tuned in, welcome to We're Not Really Here. We're going to be with you right up until kickoff. Then we'll be back at half time and full time. Joining us in the studio with myself and Natalie, it is Caroline Weir and Jill Scott. Um, I don't want to spend too much time in it, but we, we did, of course, have the FA Cup semi. I know, Natalie, I'm sorry, against Arsenal, um, which resulted in that 2-0 that loss. And I feel like you've kind of hit the nail on the head, what you said before, Joe, is that we almost are the architects of our own downfall in that with the, the game that we play in the style. It feels like it is usually down to us whether we win or lose. And it, the two Aubameyang goals felt like that uh, at the weekend a little bit for me. Yeah, I think we just we didn't really get our rhythm, did we? I think, obviously, looking at the goals, um, just in terms of the way that we play, we're usually creating a lot more chances. Um, and sometimes it just doesn't happen. Like, you, you look and maybe you can rely on certain players to be having good games, but sometimes it might be two, three, four, just not on it that day. And unfortunately, this did fall on semi-final day. And, and the other thing that we were talking about here in, in the studio is that um, f for all the great games that we've seen, a couple of the losses throughout the season have kind of followed that format in that, you know, we, we've dominated possession, had lots of shots, but it's still not resulted in the result. I think you think back to, to Spurs was one, United, um, Norwich. So when, when you see something that keeps on happening, Caroline, do you have to go, right, we need to change something? Or do you stick with the belief of going, no, it works the majority of the time. We just have to iron out some crinks. I think so. I think as much as that was a disappointing result, City have come back flying and, and they do still score so many goals and create a lot of chances. It is frustrating though when you have, you know, a lot of the ball and you can't seem to score. Like Jill says, sometimes that does just happen. But yeah, if, if it happens consistent, consistently, you do have to look at things. But at the same time, you have to trust your system and the process and um, yeah, and keep working on it. And, and if it's small little things that need change, then uh, looking at that on the training pitch. 
One thing um, I, w I wanted to ask you both about, because of course you are both midfielders, and, and tell me if I'm wrong here, I'm trying to put on my, my best footballing cap here, but it felt like in the game, that pivot position that we've learned, that I've learned so much about since Pep coming in, is is crucial to the way that City played that Fernandinho Rodri role. Gundogan was kind of in that role, but I felt like we, we missed it a little bit in the Arsenal game. We couldn't quite build up that rhythm. Why is that such a, a crucial role in, in Pep's system? It's a tough, I'm sorry if it's a tough question. I'm just so interested. And you I was probably... like, two midfielders, uh, let's ask the question. We need um, Kira Walsh here, yeah, I think. So that. we're more attacking. But the way that you play, it does go through that position a lot of the time. So they're always looking to add a number to kill off the forwards. Um, so I'm sure Arteta will have done his research and tried to stop that position from playing. So I know last season, I don't want to give away a lot of our secrets, but if Kira did get marked, which she did a lot, um, then Kira has would then drop in and kind of try and solve it that way but it's so difficult when you're drilled in a certain way to just suddenly change the way you're playing in a game imagine if they just started going long um <laughs> looking for the long ball and trying to score a goal as quickly as possible so i think it's the same as us sometimes you you believe in what you know is right and sometimes it it, it just doesn't happen and that's why we love the game football Oh, absolutely. And then, and then off that. So, say when you've, you've been you practicing, you've been been training for, for the game, and then the minute like the the whistle goes, you're five minutes in and realise actually they're doing something different. Yeah. What what do you what what is it then? Do you go all right? We change or no? Let's just keep with it, even though it might not be working. Yeah, well, that does happen, and and usually we we'll, we'll kind of think about different scenarios, you know, and hopefully we won't be caught off guard. But you can't plan for everything, so if that does happen, it's kind of up to the players, isn't it, on the pitch to to think of something new, and then. Um, at half time probably going in and the coach has probably thought of something you know a new system or or um, trying to counteract what they're doing to us but yeah no it can be tricky especially when you're not expecting it and it's just about being adaptable and, and changing a few things and hopefully that's the way a lot of the um, teams are like when they're playing us because as we've already mentioned and we talk about a lot sometimes you look at our team sheet and you think okay who is playing where and you try and work it out because they, they can play in so many different positions like we said Phil Foden can pretty much play anywhere left right centre and Bernardo Silva's simile and a few other players um, so in terms of an opposition team against us do you think they might be sort of taking five minutes at the start to weigh it up and then they might have like a plan A B and C that they click into I think it must just be so difficult because yeah you look at Phil Foden and there is a certain structure uh, in the way that we play but there's also a lot of freedom as well so Phil's obviously on that left but he can come inside a lot as well and uh, interchange position so yeah I wouldn't like to be marking them players because you sit off you give them possession of the ball and they're going to create chances you decide to go and press they'll just pop you off so yeah it's it's a very difficult one really it's, it's killer I just wouldn't know what to do I was also <laughs> do you know when you were saying that I was thinking when I played the odd I played the odd 11 a side game but like you know when you can see your half isn't going well five minutes in and all my mates are thinking of is just get to half time like no one's thinking about trying to change anything at all like and I think that having that 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 mental mindset though is almost half of half of the battle isn't it throughout the game whether it's highs or lows keeping headstrong is just as important as what you're doing with the ball I guess yeah, absolutely. I think as well in the big games when it, it literally can go either way, that's the most important thing. If if you're under pressure, it's about just, you know, focusing, keeping the ball at the back of the net. And, and at the same time, if, you, if you're, you've you got a lot of the ball creating chances, it's about putting the ball away and, um, yeah, just keeping kind of level throughout the game as much as possible, which is hard because obviously football can be an emotional game. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that is key, definitely. Now, we played Watford earlier in the season and had that remarkable 8-0 win. Um Hopefully, do you think that might, with the players remembering that, going into today's game, do you think that might give them a little bit more? We're going to see all, all the goals now, so it might take a minute. Um, I actually brought my son to this game. He was one at the time. He's now two. So he, one of his first City games, he saw eight goals. Like, well, okay. Yeah, I think he doesn't have a clue, really. He, just, he thinks that just happens constantly. Do you think that might give the players a bit more po sort of positivity going into the game, knowing that we scored eight goals earlier in the season? Or are we? do you sort of just, is it the old cliche, every game one at a time yeah I think you kind of forget like it might you might get reminded of it but I think in them games sometimes when we've beat teams by a lot of goals if you're reminded of it it ends up being this really tight game where there's like one goal in it 
and you think, oh, last time we beat them like 6 7 nil, but it rarely happens twice. Um, I might be made to eat my words. So you stop, we stop talking about it now. Yeah. Stop talking about it. Yeah. But I'd, I'd be very surprised um, if, if they have touched on it because, as you say, it's, it's a new game, different circumstances, um, different manager. So I suppose everything's different in a way. Now, um, we've seen him be quite instrumental. I mean, he's on the ball there and it's just, oh, it's, I mean, it's delicious. Bernard David to Bernardo. <laughs> we all just um, went, oh. I, 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 but I, I like to spend five minutes of every show of We're Not Really Here um, <laughs> talking about David Silva. And, of course, two attacking midfielders. Um, he is one of our, the best attacking midfielder I've ever seen. Um, Jill, we'll start with you. What do you make of David Silva? I do, I oh, love this. It's my favourite five oh, minutes of the show. I thought it's the best. I know. I, do, I can't even put him into words. He's, he's like a magician, to be honest. Uh, you speak about Phil Foden, and I think he really does model his game on him. But just the way he turns with the ball in such like... It looks so easy when you watch it, but it's not. The way he just turns, faces forwards, and then passes he sees. Um, yeah, he's been a fantastic player for this team, and I don't think you'll ever get another one, to be honest. No, and, and, and Caroline, um, kind of going off what you were saying before about like, you know, the importance of our, our final third attack, he has been instrumental in what we've done over the, the last 10 years. What would you try and do if you were to come up against David Silva? Oh, I don't know. I don't think there's much you can do. Um, I think I'd be struggling. But yeah, no, like Jill says, he's unbelievable. I think he just makes things look so easy. It's a bit of a cliche, but he's just naturally so gifted. And um, he's he's obviously not the most physical player, but he seems to always be one step ahead of everyone. And I think that's just his technical ability is just so much better than everyone else's. Do you know what? Jolien told a great story um, when he was on the show. It said the uh, early days when, when kind of he was there and, and with Silva, David had said to him, like, when you, when you get the ball, play the ball over here. And Jolene's thought, well, every time I get the ball, you ain't there. Do you know what I like? <laughs> so he says he's received the ball, looked up and David wasn't there and he's gone to play it. And as he's played it, he's arrived at that moment. And it's that thing you're talking about. He just seems to be two, three steps ahead of players all the time. Something I think actually Kevin De Bruyne also has. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess that gives you an absolute lift when you come against the teams that maybe are putting the 10 men behind the ball a little bit, Caroline, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And that happens a lot um, against City. But with players like Kevin De Bruyne and David Silva, they always find a way um, to kind of break you down eventually. It might take a bit of time, but I'm a huge Kevin De Bruyne fan as well. I think he's just the way he runs with the ball and strikes the ball, um, you know, is like early cross. I just think there's nothing quite like it so yeah um it's it's always a tough tough time to come up against those guys <laughs> and jill you mentioned um phil training with david silver for the last couple of years we've heard quite a lot of people sort of questioning whether phil phone should have gone out on loan somewhere should he have gone to a championship team and i've always thought but he's training with david silver and kevin de bruyne do you think as a player you would have got more from being on the training pitch with players of those quality or or going out on loan well, I don't think it's done him any harm. As no. to, I think he's definitely improving. So I think being at a club like Manchester City, playing with them players under the guidance of Pep, I can understand why he has stayed. And as I say, he's getting more minutes um, this season, which it, which is good for him. Um, and yeah, I'm sure he must just stop sometimes and think I'm playing with my heroes, <laughs> really. But he's, <laughs> he's doing fantastic to step in at that age um, and play the way he has been playing. Um, it's incredible, really. Well, um, we're going to take a little moment to pause from We're Not Really Here and talk about the new shirts that myself and Natalie are modelling for you. Um, buzzing, <laughs> that we are. Um, but, of course, these, these were launched uh, at the end of, of last week, and we've got this little video to tell you all about it.
I love that video and I genuinely love this Same. new shirt. And two of the people that featured in that video, ta-da, are sitting here on the sofas with us. And um, when you hear about new kits, do you get as excited as players, do you get as excited as us? Because as fans, we like like the build up, there's like weeks of build up, we're thinking, oh, what's it gonna look like? What's it gonna be? Do you get excited to try a new shirt? <laughs> I think we'll have probably different answers. Go on, Kaz. I do get a bit excited, yeah. <laughs> Especially maybe the first game day. I think that's maybe more when it gets a bit more excited. But I do love seeing a new top i think it's i think it's cool yeah i think <laughs> i'm always worried about the fit of it because obviously i'm so tall that like sometimes they're like a little bit short and stuff so i'm more worried about the fit but yeah the puma kits have um they've been fantastic but yeah i think um i do get excited to see what it's going to look like but probably not as excited as some of the girls well, to be honest say, sporting the zippy because i was i know as early doors i was like that zippy is really really nice and looks even better on so oh, there you. we go um, <laughs> any any superstitions for you for yourselves when it comes to kits or kind of you know like pre-match rituals is that is that do you know not for me no i don't get into any of that um because i think people <laughs> can get away. a little bit obsessed with it and then if things don't go right then they're, it's in their head so i just stay away from all that but yeah I'm don't sure. you put your shirt on just as the whistle goes oh no 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 no, <laughs> <laughs> no i think i sometimes put my nothing really to do with kit but like my right chin pad and my right boot on first i don't know why I don't ah, know why. Okay. I'm not very good with my left foot, so maybe just to check I've got my right one on. <laughs> maybe, though, if you flip it, that might change. If you start putting your left left ones on first, yeah, then maybe. next season, <laughs> Kel Spellman called it, everyone. When you see those left-footed rockets, we know what change was that made. That is definitely not going to happen. <laughs> um, well, speaking of the new kit, we had um, some junior citizens get surprised when the kit was launched as we brought them. Check this out. It's a great little watch. So this is Luca receiving his new kit. Um, oh, I love seeing them because I'm still so excited about seeing in the new the new kits. This is Jessica opening her little present surprise. I'm liking her face already. Yeah, <laughs> it's, that was similar to Kel and I when we came in earlier and yeah. got given shirts. <laughs> and this is Harry opening his shirt as well. That is brilliant. The reason Harry didn't look super happy is because he thought he was getting shorts and socks as well. Oh. So he was just a bit gutted there. But I kind of like that. Harry's got high expectations. Yeah, and, and I, do you know what I also love, though? It's like, and I, I would have been like this as a, as a kid. But, you know, when you think you can hide, like, not being gutted about something, <laughs> clearly you can't. Yeah. Clearly you can't. But we might have a, maybe hopefully a future couple of City players there as well, getting their new kits there. The, the excitement, though, I can't wait to see now what the away kit's going to be like and the third kit and then the training kit that, that Jill's got on as well. Um, got huge reaction on Twitter That's as it. well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, can't sign me up. I actually should probably nip to the shop after we finish <laughs> or on the way into work. Um, are there any shirts for, for you guys that, you know, kind of particularly mean a lot that you've kept, whether it be for City or, or kind of in, in, in other clubs previous? Oh, that's a good question. I do like the city kit. Is it the third one? That's them colours behind you. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I do that's like cool. that one. Um, we say we look like the fruit salad suite. Yeah. <laughs> but we always seem to play quite quite well yeah, in that we kit. Did, yeah. Obviously, if you if you change your kit and you have a bad game, we all come in and go, we're not wearing that kit again. Yeah, yeah. Nothing about the performance. It was the kit's fault. Yeah. <laughs> And then, and then also, I mean, when it comes to changing shirts, I've been wanting to ask Jolien about this, but is there an etiquette, right? I've always wondered, like, do you, do you word it up at half time or is it a, a, a full time you just have to go over and, and do it, Caroline? Um, do you know, I'm not really big on that. Um, I've not, unless it was like maybe a, a, an international player that I've kind of idolised. Um, but, you know, game to game in our league, I don't think we really do that no. very often no we don't really switch shirts um in club games uh i suppose do the men do it do the men do it you don't do you know what you don't really see it as much now no. i know that actually there was uh, bernardo gave one of the arsenal players his shirt at the end of the the, the last game oh, okay. um, in, but yeah you don't really see it as much but i've always been intrigued by it <laughs> you in, in cup games i guess when you're getting a smaller team coming here then yeah. they're all going yeah, for yeah. sergio goes shirt yeah. <laughs> i think our our kit woman lisa if she's watching <laughs> She would be very mad if we came in yeah. and said, we'll give away our shirt. She'd be like, that's your top for the next year. <laughs> I think I'd just be asking for David Silvers, basically. Every game, just like yeah. David. Yeah. I'll have that one as well, mate. Yeah. Don't worry about it. 
Um, well, on the way, uh, we want to talk about something that's coming up towards the end of the season. Uh, is our player of the season, and we've got three kind of well, a, a lot of people that are in contention, but we're down to our final three in the form of Riyad Mahrez, Kevin De Bruyne, and Raheem Sterling. Um, it's an incredibly tough choice. All have done done so much. Um, for you, though, Joe, we'll begin with you. Is there, is, there, is there a preference there? Sorry, it was uh, De Bruyne, David and uh, Riyad Mahrez who yeah. are our final three to choose from. I have to say De Bruyne. I just think he's been, I think he's been one of the best players in the world this season. Um, so, yeah, I just love to watch him. I think the way he changes a game in an instance, yeah, I'd have to say De Bruyne. What about for you, Karen? I'd have to agree. Um uh, yeah, like Jill said, he just can impact the games like no other player, I think. He's so consistent at that highest level, and I just don't think you see that very often. So, yeah, I'd have to go with Kevin De Bruyne again. It's tough, Natalie. Have you, have you, do you know where, where your heart lies on this one? Oh, well, obviously, there's the huge sentimental value of it being David Silva's yeah. last season and wanting him to have extra recognition but I think Kevin De Bruyne is not only our best player I think he's the league's best player and I only hope that there's some sort of sense when it comes to the national awards voting um, but this vote for our player of season is chosen by you so you can get on now and vote for who the city player of the season is and to do that you just need to go to mancity.com slash vote I think Slash citizens, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mancity.com slash citizens. If you ever hear on We're Not Really Here the word Graham mentioned, I want to bring you all in on this now. Graham is our voice of God and the man within our ear. So whenever you hear Graham mentioned, you now know who we're talking about. We want everyone to be across, you know, on the same page here. Whenever we suddenly change our mind, it's because Graham's told us. <laughs> Um, individual accolades, though, of course, because we saw Steph Houghton, of course, got, got your player of the, the, the season. And, and, and just how good has she been for you? I mean, for this season, but actually across the years, Jill. Yeah, she's been great. Um, obviously, captain for the whole time now, six, seven years. And I think she just really leads by example. Um, every day on the training pitch, gives 100% committed. Um, but yeah, individual awards are a bit of a funny one, really, because I'm only saying this because I never get them. <laughs> It's going to put it out there. But I think, um, yeah, in, in a team game, usually it's the goal scorers that get them. So I think it's good that a defender's been recognised. Um, Kaz, did you set that one up? I did, yeah. yeah so <laughs> indirect <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. But yeah, Kaz, you've had a few individual awards, I reckon. Uh, no, no, not really, not recently. Um, but yeah, uh, I, th I think Steph obviously thoroughly deserves that and it's, it's nice to kind of recognise players that have stood out for the team. You've been very humble though because of course you did get the um, goal of the season award for the goal that we have cooed over. Um, is it nice though to, be, to have that sort of extra recognition f f which essentially has come from the fans? Yeah, it's lovely to have the support of the fans, definitely, and, and they've supported us so well this season. So, um, yeah, we're super grateful for that. And, um, yeah, we look forward to seeing them back, hopefully, at some point uh, within the next season. If you've just tuned in to We're Not Really Here, we are talking ahead of tonight's away game at Vicarage Road. We take on Watford, who just need one point to secure safety that they'll be in the Premier League next season, where City have secured second, but are up for trying to build up some momentum. Kickoff is just over 10 minutes away. We're going to get into our predictions in just a second. But, Jill, I just wanted to go back to something you spoke about at the start. Of course, you've got a new role, which is that player coaching role. Um, and it seems to be a thing that's popping up more and more. So what will that look like then? Do you, will you have to be involved in the... the the backroom staff meetings as well as the player meetings and then also setting some sessions or, or running them as well so being involved in them how, how, do you know how it's going to work yeah I don't think I'll be there the day before a game when they're announcing the team <laughs> 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 like, why am I not in it why am I not in it um, but yeah I'm not too sure I think the coaching it'll start off just getting a bit of confidence really maybe working with um, the younger girls the academy girls uh, development squad as well and then yeah I, it's, it's definitely a part of the game that I do enjoy I've done a lot of coaching over the years, but at the same time, I recognise that this is a new journey and probably reflecting on when I first started playing football, you have to work your way through. So everyone keeps saying, are you going to manage Manchester City women? Are you going to manage England? And I'm like, I'm only thinking to next week about the passing, <laughs> passenger I've got to remember in my head. So yeah, it's an, it's an exciting journey and hopefully I'll be all right at it. And yeah, we'll just see where it goes. 
I'd love to see you managing City and then England if we do one and then the other. That would be nice. Thank you. Um, another part of the game that I know you both really enjoy is off the pitch, which is obviously the community and charity side, which is such a huge part of this club. You've both been involved with the women's team's work with the incredible Francis House Hospice. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, we went to visit um, at Christmas time. I went, I think, two years ago now. Um, and yeah, it was incredible, the support that is, that's there for uh, families and just the good work they do on, under difficult circumstances. And um, yeah, I think right now they need as much support as possible. So um, yeah, if anyone can, can help, that would obviously be great. And it's, it's a great place. Yeah, I think we went on that visit and obviously it's, it's heartbreaking when you're going into them places because you know that there's going to be children there with life-threatening illnesses. But there was such a happiness around the place and um, the staff were amazing and the, the kids were so happy as well. And they also support the families, which is great. So to hear that they're struggling at this time uh, does make us all very sad. And as Kaz touched on, they are looking for donations. So if anybody can help in any way, it would be great for them to continue the the great work that they do and Manchester City as a whole does so much for the community it's something that we're really proud of as fans and I'm sure you you feel the the same um, as players with regards to everything that the club does for the local community and for local charities yeah, I was I was lucky enough to go to India a few years ago and see the great work that Manchester City do. And I think what what I liked about it was sometimes say clubs will do community work, but they really had a plan for they were in India and they set this up where they were the teaching people and coaching people so that they had qualifications then to carry on the project when Manchester City kind of had to leave. So I think the work they do off the pitch, the staff, the amount of hours they put in, it's great. And and as you say, it's obviously the stuff on the pitch gets the most accolades and the most views and stuff. But I think Manchester City can be very proud of the community work as well. Um, you can always go and look at all the community work that goes on across the board in, at the club here in Manchester, but also around the world. If you go over to the website, there's loads of details and pages on there where you can get involved. And it really is something we are very proud of as supporters um, and, and for the players as well. Um, so we're nearly at the end of the show. Remember, we're going to be back at half time and then we'll be back at full time. Um, we do this on every show, but we ask for predictions. Prediction time for the Watford game. Natalie, I'm, I'm going to let you off. We'll come to you last, Jill. I'm going to come to you first. I'm pressure under on. pressure. I'm going to go 3 0 to City. 3 0. Okay, strong. I like it. I'm going to go 4 1 to City. 4 1 for Caroline. Okay. Yep. Natalie? I'm going to mix the two and I'm going to go 3 1. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. I, I, yes. I, I fancy us, but I'm, you know, cautious as well. Okay, I like we're all in the same ballpark there. Okay, well, hopefully, come full time, one of us will be right, or we'll definitely have been close. Now, before we go, um, there is a very it's a day, a big day today. It is National Belgium Day, and we've got this little video here to talk all about and celebrate it. I remember it as yesterday. He had blonde hair and just knew the name, Kevin De Bruyne. He's born with it. He didn't stop. Even his feet were blisters on it and everything. Back again, six years old. He came into the national team when he was very, very young. And all of a sudden, before you knew, that was like, it's the best player we have. <laughs> he was very honest and directly that Wolfsburg is just a step for him. Kevin is the modern playmaker. For me, perfect package. He can do everything. Masterclass player. He's one of the best players I ever turned in my life. <laughs> The first time I saw him, I knew that this guy is going to be one of the best players in the world. Made in Belgium, that is coming soon to City, plus, of course, following the Made in series that has been started. We have the Made in Gran Canary, which, if you haven't seen, go and watch. That is all about the magician, our little Merlin, David Silva. OK, the teams are in the tunnel, I believe. So we've got a couple of minutes just till kickoff. Remember, we're not really here. We're going to be back at half time, and then we'll be back with you at full time, of course, joined by Caroline Waite and Jill Scott. Thank you so much for this show. Natalie, thank you to you, and thank you to you for joining us. We'll see you at half time. Enjoy the game. Come on, City. <laughs> 